after the release of neurotransmitters, those, those uh, neurotransmitters need to be cleared from the synapse. And there's basically two ways of doing that. One is to pick them back up, so take them inside a cell. And this would be through um, high affinity transporters in a process we call reuptake. The other option is to break down that neurotransmitter. So there are going to be enzymes floating around in the synapse that target a subset of neurotransmitters and when they uh, either remove or add uh, small chemical groups to them that changes their structure and changes their ability to bind to their receptor. Some neurotransmitters will be regulated by both mechanisms, transport and degradation. Others will have one but not the other. After release, neurotransmitters also help terminate their own uh, signaling through feedback by binding to autoreceptors. So uh, the presynaptic site that releases the neurotransmitter will have a way of sensing how much neurotransmitter is out there in the synapse. If neurotransmitter levels are high, that's going to inhibit further release of neurotransmitter through feedback inhibition. So this is a nice built-in uh, safety mechanism. Now, some neurotransmitters are going to be released in sort of unconventional methods. We're going to talk about two examples of that. That would be our endocannabinoids and nitric oxide. These are uh, going to pass freely through membranes, and therefore they can't be stored in vesicles. So they're synthesized on demand, and when they're made, they move freely through membranes and interact with their targets. Some transmitters aren't actually released from neurons. You'll notice I didn't call them neurotransmitters. We call these gliotransmitters because glia can release neuroactive substances to affect activity at the synapse uh, and, and uh, neurons themselves. <clears throat> so let's dive into it. So in the last lecture, we released neurotransmitters, uh, so we understand how that works. Now we need to terminate the signal, because if neurotransmitters are left in the synapse for a prolonged period of time, they become noise, and we get desensitization of that synapse. If we fail to clean it up, that synapse becomes insensitive to that neurotransmitter. And this is likely uh, the, the reason that SSRIs are helpful. Of course, over a long period of time. It'd be the homeostatic downregulation of neurotransmitter receptors. We want to avoid that. So each neurotransmitter is going to have at least one way, if not two, of removing it from the synapse. One option would be transporters. So transporters are going to be located around the periphery of the synapse so that only as neurotransmitters try to move away are they going to get cleaned up. Now some will be located on the presynaptic site and others will be located on glia. So these transporters are going to remove the neurotransmitter and what they're going to do is ride along passive ion gradients. So they're going to transport other ions along to bias directional reuptake of the neurotransmitter. So the reason we call it reuptake is after release we take it back up. <clears throat> so the example shown here would be uh, dopamine transporters and norepinephrine transporters and despite their name these are promiscuous. So they're going to transport any good old catecholamine. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you're a dopamine transporter, you'll pick up norepinephrine just fine. The norepinephrine transporter, despite its name, will still pick up dopamine. These are going to be the targets of a, of a variety of drugs. Cocaine and uh, amphetamine are well-known examples. Cocaine will inhibit dopamine transporters, and amphetamine will reverse dopamine transporters. Uh, this explains not only their effects, but also their highly addictive nature. Cocaine is a highly um, addictive drug, and we can see that here. You can also see that if you've ever uh, met a long-term cocaine user. But in rats, cocaine is also uh, addictive. So if you'll look in at these data on top, we're just looking at wild type. Uh, uh, I, I believe these are actually rats, uh, not mice. So they have transgenic rats in this case. And what they did was train the rat to press uh, a lever to inject cocaine directly uh, into its brain. And of course, uh, this is a good thing to the rat, so they learn quickly to press that lever. Uh, 
The number of presses is shown on the y-axis, so as the line goes up, that's showing you that the rat enjoys cocaine. The x-axis is just showing us time. The bottom is in dopamine transporter knockouts. So after the dopamine transporter has been removed, these rodents still learn to press that lever and cocaine is still pretty good to them, even though they don't have dopamine transporters. And this is just showing us the promiscuous nature of these catecholamine transporters. Now there are of course serotonin transporters. Uh, there are also glutamate and GABA transporters. We don't have acetylcholine transporters though. So that's the exception here. All other neurotransmitters are going to have transporters. So glutamate and GABA transporters uh, can be located on glio. So we encountered this already in lecture 5. So after release, glutamate or GABA can be picked up. They're going to be picked up either by excitatory amino acid transporters, if it's the excitatory amino acid glutamate, or by GABA transporters, if it's GABA. So this cartoon is showing you uh, the presence of excitatory amino acid transporters on both neurons and astrocytes. Here's some uh, amino gold labeling showing you the presence of uh, GABA transporters on that astrocyte perisynaptic process, shown kind of just above the symmetric synapse there. So it's symmetric, that means it's inhibitory. It should be using GABA if we're in the forebrain, and thus the presence of GABA transporters makes sense. And here's a cartoon showing that in case you prefer these. Now, after we pick up either glutamate or GABA, we're going to recycle it into glutamine and send it back to the neuron, just like we did in lecture five. All that stuff is still true, except when it's not. And we'll see an example of that at the end of this talk. Enzymatic degradation does not take place for glutamate, GABA, or glycine. So those most commonly used neurotransmitters are not broken down. Instead, they are either taken up directly into neurons or, in the case of astrocytic uptake, let's say we'll pick up GABA, we'll convert that to glutamate, convert that to glutamine, and then spit that back out for neurons to take up. If we spit out glutamate or GABA, these are still neurotransmitters, and thus they're still going to activate neurotransmitter receptors. We don't want to do that if we're simply recycling. That's why we must convert to glutamine. Now, the enzymatic degradation is going to be uh, important for your, your monoamines, particularly your catecholamines, uh, but this is also true for serotonin. There appears to be uh, extracellular monoamine oxidase, although it's primarily intracellular, as this cartoon is showing us. Monoamine oxidase will hit all of our monoaminergic uh, neurotransmitters. <clears throat> the monoamine oxidase is going to replace that amine group with a hydroxyl. And then we have catechol O-methyltransferase. And that's just going to methylate the hydroxyl uh, group, the M-hydroxyl on the catechol group. So this won't take place for serotonin. And so largely serotonin is going to be regulated by reuptake through serotonin uh, transporters. There does seem to be extracellular monoamine oxidase though that will break down serotonin, but that's minor. You should mostly think of serotonin as being regulated through reuptake. There is extracellular degradation uh, that takes place but it's not to the same extent that we see with the catecholamines. Now for acetylcholine, the only way we regulate that is through degradation. So acetylcholinesterase or butyrylcholinesterase are going to break apart that acetate and that choline. The choline will then be taken back up, but we don't have acetylcholine transporters. And we, we also don't have our GABA, glutamate, and glycine degrading enzymes. So for those, only reuptake. Now, when neurotransmitters are floating around in the synapse, they're of course going to bind to their postsynaptic targets, and we'll cover more of that um, in, in uh, lectures 8 and 9. On the presynaptic side of things, there are also autoreceptors that are going to regulate synthesis and release of neurotransmitters. This is going to be an important way for the neuron to sense how much neurotransmitter have I spat out. If there's a whole lot floating around, I probably shouldn't spit more out. I need to allow time for that neurotransmitter to get cleaned up. Now, of course, in order to sense that, the neuron has to have a receptor to bind its own neurotransmitter. And if it's at the same synapse, we would call this an autoreceptor. If we're at a different synapse, let's say there's another presynaptic site over here, 
this neurotransmitter binding here, that would be auto. Another synapse, hetero. So autoreceptors and heteroreceptors are just found at presynaptic sites, and it just depends on which neurotransmitter binds to it. But they're the same thing. They're going to regulate presynaptic release, and most likely what they're going to do is decrease the likelihood of spitting out neurotransmitters. <clears throat> One of the ways that they can do this is by targeting the synthesis of neurotransmitters. So a good example of this would be with dopaminergic neurons. Dopaminergic neurons are going to have D2 autoreceptors. D2 receptors, as we're going to find out uh, later in lecture 9, are GI coupled. And what that means is that uh, activation of this D2 autoreceptor is going to inhibit the enzyme adenylyl cyclase and that will lead to a decrease in cyclic AMP levels. This will make sense a little bit later. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. Protein kinase A, because there's less cyclic AMP around, will see a decrease in its activity level. Whenever dopamine binds to its autoreceptor. So, in a few steps, dopamine binding reduces protein kinase A activity. Now, not every dopamine receptor does this. There's also D1 dopamine receptors that have the opposite effect. They're GS coupled, so they stimulate adenylyl cyclase, increase cyclic AMP, and thus would increase protein kinase A. But dopamine neurons don't have a high level of D1. They have a high level of D2 dopamine receptors. Therefore, dopamine neurons, in the presence of dopamine, are going to see a decrease in protein kinase A activity and thus there will be reduced phosphorylation of protein kinase A's targets. One of those, as you might imagine, would be tyrosine hydroxylase, the first enzyme needed to synthesize dopamine. So if we decrease tyrosine hydroxylase levels, we're going to decrease dopamine levels. So when dopamine binds to its autoreceptor, that drops tyrosine hydroxylase activity, and that decreases L-dopa, and thus dopamine levels. So if we have high levels of dopamine in the synapse, we create less dopamine, because obviously we don't need it. And here are the data that show us this. There's a few different phosphorylation sites that are shown on top. And they just either get the filled, open, or striped bars. The one that we care about is the filled bar. So this is um, serine 40 on tyrosine hydroxylase. That's what we're looking at here. So they have uh, specific antibodies that will bind to that uh, tyrosine hydroxylase only when it's phosphorylated at serine 40. So the purpose of phosphorylation is to change the structure and thus the function of the enzyme. So phosphorylated tyrosine hydroxylase has a slightly different structure, so antibodies can target that specifically. When the D2 dopamine uh, receptor agonist quinparol is added, what we see is a decrease in phosphorylation. So the raw data are shown just below that. You can see the western blot, and they're plotted above. When you measure dopa levels, that's on the bottom, you can see quinparol decreases dopa levels because quinparol stimulates D2 receptors. So stimulate D2 decrease the activity of tyrosine hydroxylase because we have reduced phosphorylation, decrease the production of dopa, decrease dopamine. Now, of course, you can block this whole thing by applying the D2 class agonist, aticlopride, and that's just shown in the western blot above that. All of this is to say that autoreceptors can decrease the synthesis of the neurotransmitter that bound them. And that logic should make good sense. If there's a lot of dopamine around, enough to bind our autoreceptors, Either we're releasing too much or we're not clearing it properly. So we probably don't need to spit out as much dopamine. Those autoreceptors can also regulate the level of neuronal activity really through the same mechanism here. But rather than going all the way to protein kinase A and hitting tyrosine hydroxylase, we're going to stop at the level of cyclic AMP. That cyclic AMP is going to stimulate cyclic nucleotide gated cation channels. That's the key term, cation channels. So that cyclic AMP is normally going to stimulate cation channels that depolarize the neuron. Again, 
decrease cyclic AMP levels, decrease cation conductance, and thus decrease depolarization. So what you should see is a decrease in their activity, and that's exactly what these data show us. Whether you apply straight up dopamine or quinparol, the D2 agonist, you see basically the same thing. And that's a long-lived decrease in the excitability of those dopamine neurons. And that's likely because of the mechanism I've drawn in this cartoon here for you. Again, D2, GI couple, decreases the activity of uh, adenylocyclase, decreases cyclic AMP levels, and decreases cation conductance, reducing the excitability of our dopamine neurons. And of course, we can regulate vesicular fusion. There are several options here, as this cartoon is showing you. We can regulate uh, calcium channels, potassium channels, the snare complex. We have many options. And we can see either facilitation or uh, uh, inhib inhibition of presynaptic release. So we could, we could facilitate um, release by depolarizing the cell, either by inhibiting potassium conductances or perhaps opening up uh, or decreasing the conductance of calcium channels. Of course, depolarization or facilitation of calcium conductances will increase calcium levels and thus increase the likelihood of neurotransmitter release. On the other hand, those autoreceptors could also then inhibit the release of neurotransmitter either by uh, interfering with snare complex formation so post-translational modifications to the snare proteins could interfere with their ability to zipper up and thus stimulate neurotransmitter release, as we saw in the last lecture. Or they can inhibit, inhibit voltage-gated calcium channels, decreasing uh, calcium conductance into the presynaptic site. If there's lower levels of calcium, there's a lower probability of release. They could also stimulate uh, uh, potassium channels, hyperpolarizing the presynaptic site. There's a lot of options here. So, those autoreceptors can act at the level of the synthesis of the neurotransmitter, at the, the activity of the neuron, of course, action potentials stimulate neurotransmitter release, and they can also act at the level of neurotransmitter release. So even if you fire an action potential, autoreceptors can decrease the probability of release through a variety of mechanisms. Now, not all neurotransmitters are going to require this nerve complex to be released. So in this part, we're going to talk about some unconventional neurotransmitters that don't get stored in vesicles and seem to go in the opposite direction. So they're going to be released from postsynaptic sites and affect presynaptic sites. We're going to start off with the endocannabinoids. So these are going to be derived from lipids. So now we're in the postsynaptic site. Endocannabinoids are going to be synthesized on demands because they're derived from lipids. They are thus lipophilic, hydrophobic, and unable to be stored in vesicles so that lipid bilayer can't contain them. They can move right through it. <clears throat> Whenever um, the postsynaptic neuron is stimulated, <clears throat> This can lead to the synthesis of endocannabinoids by stimulating, uh, for example, GQ-coupled neurotransmitter receptors. Uh, this can then stimulate phospholipase C. We're going to see this again in Lecture 9. Phosphatidylinositol bisphosphate is going to get cleaved then. The thing that we care about is diacylglycerol. There's this soluble inositol triphosphate that we don't care about until Lecture 9, but that's going to help stimulate calcium influx. Diisoglycerol is going to be further uh, modified by diisoglycerol lipase to form 2-AG. This is a lipophilic endocannabinoid. This is going to freely move across the membrane and bind to CB1 receptors at the presynaptic site. And what they're going to do is decrease the likelihood of release probability. So when the postsynaptic site is strongly stimulated, it makes sense then to inhibit the presynaptic site. This is all just homeostasis. We want to make sure we're not going to get overly excited. So once we excite the postsynaptic site, that can lead to the production of endocannabinoids that then temporarily decrease release probability. And they can do this through a few ways, just like we talked about with autoreceptors. So these CB1 receptors are going to be inhibitory. What they're going to do is decrease the activity of adenylylcyclase, decreasing cyclic AMP levels,
That can reduce the degree of depolarization at the presynaptic site. It can also reduce protein kinase A activity. So we can see a decrease in uh, calcium channel conductance as a result. And the G proteins themselves can also interact with voltage-gated calcium channels. So the end product is a decrease in the amount of calcium entering the presynaptic site. And what that looks like is a decrease in release probability. So we can see this in a couple of ways. So first of all, let's just start at the top. The y-axis is showing you the amplitude of the excitatory postsynaptic current. They're doing a paired pulse here. So we should remember this. Paired pulse uh, studies are used to look at whether there's any presynaptic changes. And what we're seeing here are two things. The amplitude of that first peak is dropping. That's shown on the y-axis, and you can also see it in the raw data between the two plots. So when the synthetic cannabinoid HU, looks like 210, uh, is applied to the slice, the postsynaptic currents decrease in amplitude, and that second pulse becomes facilitating. What both of those indicate to us is that we have a decrease in release probability. So we have fewer vesicles fusing the first time. That's what explains the decrease in the EPSC amplitude. So the excitatory postsynaptic currents are now weaker because of cannabinoids. So strong stimulation stimulates endocannabinoid production, and that prevents further strong stimulation. Of course, you can block this by applying the CB1 receptor uh, antagonist, and that's shown in the bottom panel there. So when, when we antagonize the CB1 receptor, it doesn't matter how much cannabinoid they put on, no effect. And this is just showing you that the, the effect that we're seeing in the top is specific to the CB1 receptor. So we have a decrease in release probability. So synapses aren't as likely to work. This might explain why cannabinoids affect uh, attention and memory function negatively. In order to remember stuff and pay attention, we have to have reliable synaptic signaling. And when you decrease the release probability at synapses, you decrease the reliability of synaptic function. After release, of course, we got to clean this mess up too. And so we have other enzymes that will break down our endocannabinoids. So the monoacylglycerol lipase is going to break down 2-AG to form arachidonic acid. This is not an endocannabinoid, but it can be modified to form other compounds such as the uh, vasodilators uh, that we saw in Lecture 5. <clears throat> Nitric oxide is a little bit different. So it's the same in that it's produced from the postsynaptic side of things, and this is uh, stimulated by calcium influx. So it could be GQ-coupled receptors. Again, we make this IP3. This will, in a roundabout way, as we'll find out, increase intracellular calcium. We could also just have calcium influx through NMDA receptors or voltage-gated calcium channels. So here, just some kind of channel, whether it be ligand or voltage-gated. The increase in intracellular calcium stimulates the enzyme, uh, neuronal in this case, nitric oxide synthase. This is going to synthesize nitric oxide from arginine. Nitric oxide is going to diffuse freely through membranes, just like our endocannabinoids. But unlike our endocannabinoids, it's going to increase release probability. And we don't have to clean it up. It cleans itself up. It has a half-life of about 30 seconds, and then it spontaneously degrades to nitrate. And that won't affect uh, the activity at synapses. Now what nitric oxide is going to do is probably a variety of things. It can directly bind to the snare complex to facilitate snare complex formation. So it can help remove uh, MUNC18, one of those accessory proteins that holds the snare complex in kind of that weak state. Removal of accessory proteins facilitates the formation of a tight snare complex and vesicular fusion. Nitric oxide is also going to stimulate uh, the enzyme guanylyl cyclase, which is kind of like adenylyl cyclase, but it doesn't make cyclic AMP, it makes cyclic GMP. This is another secondary messenger. Cyclic GMP isn't going to stimulate protein kinase A, it'll stimulate protein kinase G. Protein kinase G is then going to phosphorylate a variety of things, and one of the things that can happen uh, as a result of nitric oxide signaling is an increase uh, 
uh, in the activity of cyclic nucleotide gated cation channels and uh, uh, stimulation of voltage gated calcium channels, either because of depolarization or because of interactions with protein kinase G. So we see an increase in calcium uh, influx at the presynaptic site, so the polar opposite of endocannabinoids, and you see the opposite effect. So the y-axis here is showing us the level of extracellular acetylcholine. If you look at the open circles there, you'll notice it's basically a flat line. So when they don't apply any drugs, they have a fairly stable response. That's good to see because we don't see a stable response when we apply the nitric oxide synthase antagonist in LA right there at the beginning of the experiment. You'll notice the acetylcholine levels drop and that's because we've reduced the amount of nitric oxide that's being produced and thus we've decreased release probability. If we don't release acetylcholine, we can't pick it up and measure it. On the other hand, a little bit later, they apply the nitric oxide donor SIN1 there and you'll notice we go from below normal to well above normal. So we increase release probability. Now this is uh, only going to occur while we have the nitric oxide donor around because remember nitric oxide is going to break down spontaneously so after removal of the drug we see the washout. We're moving back toward baseline. Now another class of unconventional transmitters would be the gliotransmitters that are released from astrocytes to re regulate the activity of neurons and uh, synapse strength. So astrocytes themselves uh, respond to neuronal activity because they have neurotransmitter receptors, just like they did in lecture five. They still have those. And different astrocytes from different brain regions appear to have kind of a different profile of neurotransmitter receptors. So in these data, we can see the response of cerebellar and cortical astrocytes. Cerebellar astrocytes are shown in A, they're also plotted in part C, and cortical astrocytes are shown in part B, also plotted in part C. When they apply different neurotransmitters such as ATP, glutamate, and histamine, you can see variable responses. ATP is a fairly uh, commonly used gliotransmitter apparently because nearly every astrocyte responds to it. Glutamate is a lot more commonly used in the cortex, and that makes some good sense. The cerebellum is filled mostly with GABAergic synapses. And histamine is used less commonly. But you can see some astrocytes respond, and that's what C is showing us. It's the percent of astrocytes that have responded. So what they did was use an optical sensor to look at calcium levels. Remember, astrocytes don't fire action potentials. They have calcium waves. So all those spikes that you see, those positive deflections along the y-axis, over time that's showing you an increase in intracellular calcium or a response to that neurotransmitter. So astrocytes respond to neurotransmitters and these calcium waves we think then stimulate the release of gliotransmitters. And the reason we think that is because of these data over here. <clears throat> so what we're looking at is the effect of astrocyte derived deserine on synapse strength. And what we can see here is uh, that without calcium waves and the release of D-serine, we don't get LTP. And that's what they're doing in this experiment. They're stimulating long-term potentiation, which is how we think learning occurs at the cellular level. Whenever neurons fire together, their synapse gets strengthened, and so they're more likely to fire together in the future. And it's the way that we associate information together. The orange is showing us something called a calcium clamp. So the, the top there, panel B, they're showing us a patched astrocyte and they fill it up so we can actually look at it. What they're also doing is filling that astrocyte with calcium chelators so that the, the calcium that either flows into the astrocyte or out of intracellular stores gets buffered. So we don't see calcium waves. And the data that proves that isn't shown here. You just have to trust the calcium clamp works. And when you have calcium clamp, you get a little bit of short-term facilitation with that tetanus. That's what the red arrow was showing us. But you don't see long-term potentiation. Just a little short-term uh, facilitation there at the synapse. But in order to get long-lived changes, you need the astrocyte to do something. You need calcium waves in astrocytes. Now, with the calcium clamp present, if you apply D-serine, 
which is a gliotransmitter. Only astrocytes make this. The neurons won't make D-serine. So astrocytes make D-serine. They can bind to NMDA receptors. Spoiler alert uh, for lecture 10. D-serine stimulates NMDA receptors and allows long-term potentiation to occur, at least at this synapse. So astrocytes are critical for LTP, at least in some cases. Critical and sufficient for LTP, as long as you still have the tetanus. Now, astrocytes can also just release straight up glutamate or ATP, adenosine, GABA, kynurenic acid. So there's a variety of gliotransmitters they can release to stimulate a variety of neurotransmitter, or I guess in this case, gliotransmitter receptors on neurons. And these can be at pre- or postsynaptic sites. They can either increase or decrease activity at the synapse. So the postsynaptic receptors, this may very well just lead to a little bit of depolarization. The presynaptic receptors, again, those can cause facilitation or inhibition of presynaptic release. The devil's in the details. The key factor here is that the gliotransmitter can also stimulate those receptors so that the neurotransmitter, that ligand that binds to the receptor, doesn't actually have to be a neurotransmitter. It could be a gliotransmitter. And one nifty idea here is that astrocytes kind of set the tone for uh, neuronal activity. How active should a neuron be? And that depends on how much glutamate and GABA is floating around. How much excitation and how much inhibition is there, essentially. <clears throat> so the glutamate and GABA are, are essentially always released from astrocytes. That's the idea. There's tonic release, and that's going to determine the level of activity of, of the, the neurons there. So I, I pointed out the GABA, glutamate, glutamine cycle, but we don't always take uh, the, the neurotransmitter to glutamine. There can be release of glutamate or GABA. And these two uh, gliotransmitters, in this case, exist in equilibrium. Glutamate is used to create GABA. GABA can be used to create glutamate. So as the levels of one rise, so will the other. It's just basic chemistry. And we have transporters for both. And there can be reverse transport if the levels get high enough. So let's see what this might look like in the real world rather than a cartoon. So the idea is that if we have a lot of glutamate around, well, we probably want to release some GABA to cancel out all that excitation. Again, it's homeostasis. You need the gas, you need the brake. So if we see a lot of gas around, there's a lot of glutamate, astrocytes are going to pick that up, turn it into GABA, and spit that GABA out to help regulate neuronal excitability so the neurons don't get hyper-excited. At least it looks like that in the dish. And we assume this happens in real life as well. If you look at these data, so look on the top. What they're looking for is radioactive GABA. And this can only be derived from the radioactive glutamate that they've applied. So normally neurons don't have radioactive stuff in them, and neither do astrocytes. So they put on these radioactive uh, um, amino acids, in this case glutamate, and they look for radioactive GABA. And there's, you can only have radioactive GABA if it was derived from that radioactive glutamate. So on the x-axis, on the top, they're applying different doses of radioactive glutamate. And what they're measuring then is the amount of radioactive GABA either in the cell, that'd be the filled bars, or outside the cell, that'd be the open bars. And what you'll notice is as you increase glutamate concentrations applied, so go from, going from left to right, there's a decrease in the amount of intracellular GABA and an increase in the amount of extracellular GABA. Because there's a lot of glutamate floating around outside, we want to spit out some GABA to counteract that excitation. You can see that across time in panel B. So the y-axis there is showing us the extracellular radioactive GABA. Then they apply glutamate. You can see there for uh, somewhere in the ballpark of about 10 minutes. And you see this, this transient rise in GABA that goes along with the increase in extracellular glutamate. And once we remove the glutamate, GABA goes back down. So this is a way for astrocytes to make sure neurons that are getting excited don't get overly excited. That's the idea anyway. Don't get overly excited about it because all this stuff is still in a dish. So gliotransmission is kind of an emerging idea uh, in, in neuroscience. And it's one that's kind of attracted because of the increase in the number and complexity of astrocytes throughout evolution. So it would be nice if they were doing something kind of important
and they might help explain why we're so darn smart, at least sometimes. But it's kind of confusing. Uh, and if you found any confusion along the way, make sure you fill out that questions box. I'll answer those in class, uh, or, well, and, and also uh, in writing there. Speaking of class, I'll see you in class.